Film fans sometimes bemoan the frequent use of computer-generated special effects and characters today, how fake they look, and how much better it was when everything was done practically and with puppets. And yes, there are some fantastic effects and puppetry work that hold up tremendously well. However, not all of them have, and two primary examples are from the films I'm going to compare today. Howard the Duck and Jack Frost. Both of these notorious bombs hinged so much on the puppets that led them, although there were certainly other problems too. First, a little bit of history. Howard the Duck, of course, began life as a Marvel comic book, which found a fan with George Lucas, who bought the film rights. He gave the project to his friend, Willard Hayek, to direct, with Hayek's wife, Gloria Katz, co-writing the script with him. The original and most logical intention was to make Howard the Duck an animated film, but Universal had a hole in their summer 1986 schedule, and the film was rushed into production as a live-action film. It has since developed a sizable cult following, but I don't count myself among them. Jack Frost, meanwhile, was a film that was toiling around Warner Brothers for a number of years. Sam Raimi was even attached to direct at one point. Yeah, you'd think it would be the Jack Frost with the evil snowman, but nope, it was this one. Instead, Troy Miller, primarily a director of stand-up specials and sketch shows, got in the chair, with the studio giving the film an $85 million budget. I wish I was joking. The on-set snowman was created by the Jim Henson Creature Shop, while the CG snowman that occasionally appears was handled by Industrial Light and Magic. And yet, this was the best puppet they could apparently afford. This snowman is monumentally creepy, especially when he starts following his son Charlie around. A large part of the problem is how little expression he's allowed to have. Even when they switch the CG snowman for certain scenes, the effects artists are still limited in what they can do. There's a reason Frosty the Snowman is usually depicted with standard cartoon eyes. Jack Frost has got those call eyes, so it's an uphill struggle to make him look lovable and charming. Howard the Duck is a lot more expressive, though the design still feels off, mostly those strange yellow circles around his eyes. The Howard from the comics looked a tad too much like Donald Duck, so it's at least understandable why the filmmakers went for a different design. Watching Howard the Duck, the suspension of disbelief is mostly lost, because one can never escape the thought of just watching actors in a costume, as opposed to Chewbacca or E.T., who we also know are people in a suit, yet they still feel real. However, I can always see the mechanics of the Howard costume, and I'm constantly reminded how much better this would be if it were animated. Although Howard is not the creepiest puppet in this film. Rather, it's this thing. And no, I'm not removing the censor bar. All I want to know is who approved that. Why did they think that would pass muster with the MPAA? They must have easily given this movie a PG. Oh, how lenient you were in the 80s, MPAA. Story-wise, neither film fares particularly well. Howard the Duck's issue is it's two completely different movies smashed together. For the first half, it's mostly a, well, duck-out-of-water story, with Howard befriending a young singer named Beverly and trying to live his life in the big city. It's not particularly exciting drama, and the comedy falls short, too. And then, halfway through, it decides it wants to throw in an evil villain trying to destroy the world with, you guessed it, a portal in the sky. Seriously, what is it with filmmakers and their obsession with sky portals? Enough already! Then, it's a slow series of scenes with the evil overlord possessing Jeffrey Jones and mostly he's just driving around. The final battle is especially long and tiring, though we do get some excellent stop-motion monster effects from Phil Tippett. The comics had a wide array of weird and crazy events and villains, but this is apparently the best story they could come up with? Jack Frost, meanwhile, goes the overly tired, workaholic father cliché, and this might be one of the worst offenders, mainly because Jack really is not a bad father. Jack has a good rapport with his wife and son, and always tries his best to be home as much as possible. He does not get obsessed with his work, and is always happy to teach his son hockey moves. But oh no, he has to go to an important gig on Christmas, and now he's the worst father ever trying to help further your music career so he can put food on our table. You're the worst! And then, when Jack changes his mind, realizes spending Christmas with his family is more important, he turns around and drives back home. And what does he get in return? 
He dies, leaving his family and best friend grieving before coming back a year later as a snowman. But if he had gone through with his music gig, he would have gotten the big job, the whole thing with his son would have probably blown over pretty quickly, and everyone lives happily ever after. So, in fact, we would have been spared looking at Mr. Creepy Talking Snowman if he had put work over family. This film's morals are really confusing. Meanwhile, Charlie's main priority when his father comes back from the dead as a snowman is to improve his ice hockey skills. Keep in mind, it takes about 40 minutes for that snowman to show up, so he's not on this earth for very long. So I would imagine they're more pressing concerns, but hey, it could be worse. Let's check in how Howard and Beverly are doing. Well, this film just got a lot higher on the creepo meter. That's right, Beverly falls in love with Howard, and it's really off-putting and kind of disgusting to watch unfold. I mean, what kind of person is attracted to anthropomorphic talking animals? I just walked right into that one, didn't I? Even looking past the fact that these are two different species, they share absolutely no chemistry, though Leia Thompson is certainly trying her best. Beverly just isn't the brightest bulb, and she's given some really stupid lines in a movie full of stupid lines and bad jokes. But don't think I'm letting Jack Frost off easy in the comedy department because the writers have lame snowman jokes and they're going to use them. The tones of these two films are fascinating. Howard the Duck seems unsure of whether it wants to be a big special effects extravaganza or a grounded comedy. It doesn't really embrace the silliness of its concept fully, outside of the opening scene on Howard's home planet and Tim Robbins' goofy performance as an assistant scientist. The whole film is shot so dark and dirty, though you could argue that's because this was the normal aesthetic in the 1980s. It needed a tone closer to what James Gunn would achieve with Guardians of the Galaxy. Although, like Guardians, Howard the Duck does have an excellent soundtrack. John and Barry wrote a wonderful score for the film that is at times sweet and at other points adventurous. The songs, performed by Beverly's band Cherry Bomb, would probably have been successful had they been in another film. Howard the Duck's theme song, which closes the movie, is instantly catchy. Jack Frost is more even in its tone, with occasional moments of light goofiness when the characters partake in a snowball fight. Through a lot of it, Troy Miller goes for a rather somber approach. He never forgets this is the story of a father and husband who dies, and the family coping with it. Even the final message is all about how Charlie can move on, while still remembering who his father is. So in the end, which is worse? Howard the Duck or Jack Frost? I'm going to say Jack Frost. Howard the Duck certainly has its problems, including a cringe-inducing love story, an uneven script, a stupid villain, and dragged out scenes. But I will admit there are a couple of slightly amusing moments, and while the Duck himself falls short, we get some decent special effects here and there. Jack Frost is ruined by how incredibly creepy the snowman is, the bothersome workaholic father cliché that ruins the whole message of the film, and the jokes that land with a thud. The sad thing is, both films had a lot of potential. Yes, even Jack Frost. If they had made it primarily about a grieving family getting one last chance to say goodbye, without throwing in the clichéd plot about the father trying to get his music career off the ground, it could have tackled some surprisingly serious subjects for a family film. Its heart was in the right place, but if given the choice, I would probably pick Howard the Duck to watch again. Now tell me, which do you think is the worst film, and I'll see you next time.